Well, I'm sure there'll be a couple more people. A few more people may come in. Um, I, I was telling Eunice that this is one of those things where everybody knows her, so I don't have to do an introduction for her, but I have to do an introduction for myself. Who is that guy up front? <laughs> anyway, my name is Bob Willie, and uh, I've had the privilege for the last now eight years uh, to serve as the president of the Friends of the Georgetown Library. I've discovered it's one of those positions, there's no term limit. Uh, <laughs> You step forward and you're staying there, and it's, but it's a blessing. It's a wonderful experience working, first of all, with a wonderful staff at the library, the Georgetown Library, and um, also wonderful to work with the friends of the library, people who come out and participate in our various programs. We'll talk a little bit more about the library and what's happening with that at the end of the program today, if I may, uh, but just glad to have you here in what is our monthly lecture series, Tuesdays with... And it's named after a book. We stole it from a book. I don't know if I had to get permission or not, but uh, Tuesdays with Maury. And it's a book that came out in 1997 that talks about a relationship between a college student and a professor that didn't end when he graduated, but continued on for many years. In fact, until the professor passed away. And it's one of those things that I think is a very special example. You're gonna, that, that's the sun. Those seats are ex particularly expensive if you sit in the sun seats. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it's uh, a wonderful relationship and one that we would like to, in some ways, uh, demonstrate through what we do with our Tuesday with lectures as we meet on the third Tuesday of each month to have topics that we think are of great interest to people and uh, on history and science and geography and all kinds of things here in Georgetown, all related to Georgetown. And it's just been a wonderful experience as we are now in our seventh finishing, getting close to the end of our seventh season of our lecture series, that's been very good. Um, today, we have Tuesdays with Eunice Brown. How's that? So she's the title of the new book. <laughs> That'd be the title of your third book of poetry could be that. And, and we invited Eunice today for two reasons. Uh, one of which is March is Poetry Month. And we have consistently had a program of poetry. Libby has been here in the past and spoken at some of them. And we're just really thrilled to have Eunice that's here. The second reason is it's spring. Ha. Uh, <laughs> and we woke up this morning to 39 degrees. So I'm blaming that on Eunice. Uh, <laughs> but that uh, is our you know, sort of a spring kick to things and also to have a celebration of a beautiful expression of God's, God's artistic skills and abilities, creative things that he's given to us with poetry. And so it's just a very special occasion. As I say, I, I don't think I need to do an introduction, but for formality, I'll do that. Uh, Eunice was, uh, is a native of Georgetown, a graduate of Claflin University in Orangeburg. She's a retired elementary school teacher with 30 years, the first time around of retirement at Sam Pitt Elementary School. And then she did five more years, a glutton for punishment, uh, continued on at uh, Kensington and at uh, Andrews elementary school as she did five more years there. Like a lot of us, retirement doesn't mean stopping things and she has stayed extremely busy as a poet, as a person who loves the crafts, active in her church, active with her sorority, just a wonderful person. We've gotten to know each other over the last several years. One of the main connections was when we were celebrating the anniversary of Bethel AME Church and she shared a beautiful poem with us at that time. That was a great kickoff. Oh, I should read a poem. It's not from the, the, the book she's going to be reading, Melodies of the Heart, but Spring is in the Air. This was one. Is that okay? May I read that one? Or were you going to read that? Or? Okay. So this was true on Saturday, Sunday, and Monday. Birds chirping everywhere, nature bursting out with flare, beauty lurching far and near. The world awakes from wintry drear to sunshine greenery for all to share. Cool breeze flowing in the trees. Gnats are swarming with the bees. There were gnats on Sunday. They were there. The no see were up there. <laughs> gnats are swarming with the bees. Kites flying oh so high, way above the clear blue sky. Children with their shouts of cheer, boasting, shouting. Spring is in the air. It's my privilege to introduce to you today, Eunice Brown, who will be sharing with us from her most recent book, Melodies of the Heart. Please join me in welcoming Eunice.
Thank you, Bob. And the poem that he read, um, I wrote as a teacher doing um, recess duties and doing recess, all the gnats and bees and pollen and everything was falling down. So I said, well, let me write a poem about this to share my experience. It is so good to be with each of you this morning, and it's so good to see my church family, my daughter, who's uh, stealing away from her job for a couple of hours to be here with me, and my friends, so thank you for coming. Um, I'm going to start off with the poem about rain. Do you like rain? Or have you, have you ever taken the time to listen to the rain? So the first poem, this poem was when I was growing up. My family home had a tin roof. And you know you can hear the raindrop falling on the tin roof. Well, now with the um, roofs now, you can't really hear the raindrop. But at that time, it was sometime it was soothing and sometime it was um, frightening. But this um, poem, Symphony of the Rain, invoked that experience from my childhood. So Symphony of the Rain. What can play such beautiful sound as raindrops cascading to the ground? Have you ever listened to the Symphony of the Rain? Its melody point out softly and loud again. Snuggling up against the window pane is a grand way to enjoy the symphony of the rain. When dark shadows roll in sight, it signals the start of a rhythmic flight. Pit hat the chords you hear. It makes you want to splash and cheer. Then the beat slowly fades away. The symphony has gone elsewhere to play. And the next poem um, was inspired by when my um, church home caught fire and burned to the ground. So the title of this was Ashes to Beauty. Our hearts were ripped in two when our home of faith disappeared in view. The physical structure laid in waste. Trusting God remains our solid base. Crumble bricks and ashes, oh, what a sight. A small voice whispered, you'll be all right. Up from the ashes, our spirit took flight. The faith we share will be our source of light. So that was uh, inspired by the um, burning down of my um, church home as a child. And the next one, someone, uh, and a lot of people be asking me to write poems for them, and sometimes I don't have the slightest idea of what am I going to write. And um, I'll start writing, and the words won't come. It's all jumbled up. And I think, that's because you didn't go to the master above to get direction. And once I pray to him, it seemed like the words just flow and um, I don't have any problems. So I always make it a habit of praying and meditating first before I write any um, poem. So the title of this one is God's Best. And it was dedica uh, dedicated to women. And I have some somewhere in my poetry book for, for men, but I won't read <laughs> that today. So God's best. When God created woman, he made the very best, wrapped her with kindness, compassion, strength, and honor like a badge upon her chest. When God created woman, caring hands he gave to pick his precious children up when fallen from God's shelter of grace. When God created woman, he fashioned a gentle heart to be a comforter and friend and his wisdom daily part. When God created woman, he gave her soothing arms to ease the disappointments, hurts, and pain and shelter his precious lamb 
from home. When God created woman, like Hannah, her prayers were heard to live a life of service and be a witness of the living word. When God created woman, he gave her sturdy feet to work until, until the setting sun, sowing seeds of faith others will surely reap. When God created woman, the world received a special gift to be a spiritual guide to everyone when to the world they turn and shift. When God created woman, he gave the world the best. He showered her with patience, grace, and love to weather every stormy test. And the next one is uh, entitled Carolina Roots. And this was written, um, my family usually have their family reunion every three years. And when we went um, to Maryland, a cousin called and asked if I would write a poem for our family reunion. So this poem was written for our family reunion and it's entitled Carolina Roots. A room full of descendants from all over the land assembling again to sound the brass band, to tell of the family's enduring stance, thanksgiving and gratitude dripping from every mouth. You can tell their roots began in the South. Before the sun danced upon our face or our feet waltzed in the Carolina sands, a petition went up for success and grace that dreams achieve will be known throughout the lands. Towering bridges were the crossing stones. With strong family support, we never cross alone. Family cheering as we conquer the sky, raising hopes of greatness enable us to fly. A room full of descendants from the Carolina shores taught to believe achieving dreams knocked at the door. We embrace the legacy whose roots began in the South, encouraging words dripping from every descendant's mouth. And if you have questions as I read the poem, be free to ask a question. And the pack. Now this poem was written um, Earlier, when I got married, my husband and I made a pact. He would do the, uh, keep the outside yard clean, the yard, and I would do the inside, keep the inside. Well, that pack is really getting me, I want to break it. <laughs> He's still out in the yard every day, but I look at the dust as I say, well, that's for a science experiment. I'll do it another day. <laughs> So this is how this uh, poem came about. A pact was made between mom and dad. The deal made everyone glad. That was at the beginning. You keep the living quarters clean. I'll maintain the outside scene. He's up at the crack of dawn. It's out the door to survey the lawn. Then you hear the buzzing of the saw. He begins trimming with the steel blade claw. No one loves yard work as much as dad. Tending the landscape makes him glad. The mole goes humming around and around. It's the neighbor's wake up sound. Visitors ask if it's professionally done. It's the work of one man and his son. Being outside has become his pal. It encourages others with their garden morale. Take pride in the work you do is what he passes on to his children too. Sometimes you have to be a one-man crew or negotiate the pack to make it new. And that's at the point I'm now ready to <laughs> negotiate this pack. <laughs> Okay, and this poem, Homecoming Time, was written um, for my 
church's homecoming um, a few years ago. I just love homecoming time. Kin folks have all come to town. Little feet prancing up and down. Scents get to strut around. Everyone making a joyful sound. Choirs singing in harmony. Elders giving their testimony. Ladies in their wide brim hat. Gentlemen whispering about this and that. I just love homecoming time. Hands waving through the air, shouts of amen heard everywhere. Heads bowed, praising his name. Life at the altar is never again the same. Church goes come and feel at home, worshiping under the golden dome. By faith we have come in one accord, our hands together, our eyes fixed on the Lord. I just love homecoming time. Granny's talking about the good old days, urging the young to follow God's perfect ways. God did not fail us in times of pain. He will not forsake us. By our side, he will remain. The church on the corner with the Bible-based plan welcomes us home where it all began. Embracing her teaching is the focus of our view. It lights our path and strengthens us too. I just love homecoming time. And the next one, uh, wonderfully made, um, and this poem was dedicated to children that was on the um, autism spectrum. My grandson is on the spectrum, so, um, and sometimes people misunderstand children who are on the spectrum. So I wrote this poem just to give them a glimpse into what autistic is all about or what autistic children is going through. Wonderfully made. An angel with his own unique style came into our lives with a priceless smile. He steals the hearts of everyone. He's independent and won't be outdone. He has so many special gifts. His attention is focused, then it shifts. I am special just like you. Some are amazed at the things I do. It takes my brain a minute or two. Learning is fun with a supporting crew. Once I see it in my head, the puzzle piece is neatly spread. If you don't understand me, I cry. If you don't understand me, I easily cry. Wish I can tell you why. When you see me cover my ears, the noise is too much for me to bear. Sometimes I like working on my own. At times, I don't want to be alone. I may not look you in the eye. Here is the reason why. My mind gets crowded by what you say. My brain is protected when I turn away. I like to talk to myself a lot. It's called stimming. It will stop. My brain is just organizing my thoughts. And this was dedicated to children on the autism spectrum. And um, this uh, next poem, um, Mary's Boy, is one of our um, leaders in the Amy Church. And he, was a, he is a member of our church. And I wrote this poem because he's always talking about um, called himself Mary's boy. His mother was named Mary. So I wrote this poem. This poem was inspired by, by the way he talked about his mother. So Mary's boy. I am Mary's boy, he likes to say, when greeting the crowds at home or away. The sparkle of pride that pops into his eyes when singing praises to the folks that nurtured him to fly. 
The early days had no crystal stairs, linoleum flows, and broken down chairs. Best friends did not tease or wrongly stare. I survived on hard work and mama's prayers. Mama said, don't quit whatever you do. The Lord will surely see you through. Keep your heart open and sincere. The trials that come, others will help you bear. Who would imagine Mary's boy spreading the gospel with humility and joy? With meager earnings and a steady gait, he's walked and talked with heads of state. I will never lose the common touch. Being a servant in my hometown means so much. Don't be ashamed of the roads you've trod. Be honest and true and let others record. Who would have imagined Mary's boy who played on our street, now walking to a higher beat, letting everyone know with life challenges you can compete. And the next one is, um, I'm not that um, technology savvy. So um, this poem, it was, um, let me find it. The Flight of Technology. Some things I can do, but the, it changes so much, it's hard for me to catch up <laughs> with technology. So I wrote this poem um, about technology. Carrier pigeons were the technology back in the day. We awaited the news because there was no other way. Slowly evolving, man's wisdom took flight, showing the world it had power and might. Every time you turn around, technology of man's imagination can be found. It crowds your every living space, limiting contact of humans face to face. The good and bad of the wisdom of man has brought heartaches and a faster plan. Sweeping the minds of the young and old, filling their days like a bad choke hole. Handwritten notes are a thing of the past. The technological trend is moving fast. Jump on board this fast paced life or be left behind in darkness and blinding strife. And sometimes I'm left behind because it's moving so fast, you don't know what to do. And the next poem is friendship. We had this, uh, I know this couple, they both lost their spouses and they became friends and companion to each other. So this poem was inspired by their relationship. And some of you may recognize the couple, but I'm not gonna call any names. <laughs> Um, and they were a member of our church, so. Uh, friendship, one can't cook, the other can't drive. The beauty of their friendship is a pathway of hope for them to survive. The soft-spoken couple, what a joy to see. Their tenderness a vision of what friendship should be. Keeping company is what the older generation said, their lives crossed by their loss and baking of sweet bread. From this caring spirit, true friendship was fed. The loss of a loved one doesn't mean the end for you or me. Our friendship will blossom into something beautiful you see. Friendship. And also, I would like to share some from the first poem, uh, book of poetry that I wrote. And the first poem is Everything Beautiful. And me and my girlfriend used to walk down um, Duke Street, 
all, around, all the way down to the boulevard and down Front Street and back to her house. So we had a chance just to take in nature and the beauty that we saw on the um, pathway around Georgetown. I love to stroll at the break of day before the dew is soaked up by the sun's beautiful rays. The quiet and stillness of the morning's fresh air allows me to commune with God and to him my soul I bear. The tree-lined streets with its magnificent branches spread cause me to shout glorious hallelujah, God is not dead. He has made everything beautiful in his time. This melodious singing takes root in my mind. My feet keep stepping with the sound in my head. Bring bursts of hallelujah, God is not dead. A gentle spring wren, like the earth, let the earth breathe anew. The rainbow remind me that God's word is true. A golden sunset of a crisp autumn day fills me with God's splendor as I watch and pray and shout glorious hallelujah, God is not dead. He has made everything beautiful, the Bible said. And the um, first time I rode through the mountains, it just took my breath away. I, and I'm just, drive, uh, my husband driving, and I'm just snapping pictures through the um, window because the beauty of the mountain was so breathtaking. And that was the first time some 10 years ago when I, uh, we rode through the mountains. So mesmerized in beauty. I travel the road others will tread. To the mountain tops God has metic meticulously fed. As far as the eyes could see, heaven and earth were embracing thee. Too potent for words alone, only God could have painted the shades of beautiful stones. The mountain tops so grander and rare looked as God had manicured it with special care. I reverenced and stood in amazement there, an awesome God, such splendor share. And this one I, we all can relate to, um, the Working Man Blues, and this poem was written when um, my brother retired. And I guess I could have, um, should have written it years before when I retired, but then when he retired, I was inspired to work, um, to write a poem about his retirement. The Working Man Blues. Turn off the sound to the Working Man Blues. It's time to collect, you've paid your dues. Don't w have to worry about work anymore. You've walked out the gate and closed the door. No more early morning lifts or staying up late working the graveyard shift. You've earned the right to be lazy a bit. Turn off the sound to the working man blues. It's time to collect. You've paid your dues. You can cruise around and take in the view of all the things a working man could not do. You can roll over and tell the mate goodbye. Sleep late until the sun's up high. You can have leisurely lunches without gulping it down, never having to rush because the foreman's not around. Turn off the sound to the working man blues. It's time to collect. It's, you've paid your dues. Don't think, you're bo don't think you'll be bored from not working all day. You've earned the right to say, I'm on a long holiday. You've got a joyful step that makes your stride seem wide. A new song in your heart that cries out loud. Turn off the sound to the working man blues. It's time to collect. 
you've paid your dues. And I think all of us can all attest to that. We've turned off the sound <laughs> to the working man blues. And, um, the, and if you notice, most of the poems I, I've experienced in some way or another. The next one is The Mountains of Pillows. And um, this is when I was on an airplane flight. And I like to sit next to the window just to look at the clouds. But now when I'm traveling with uh, my grandson, he takes over the window seat. So <laughs> it's hard for me to <laughs> look out the window and see what the um, clouds are, are doing. So this poem, um, Pillars, Mountains of Pillows. As far as the eyes could see, mountains of pillars gre greeted me. Gently sailing along the way, the metal birds split the air without delay. Suddenly, the softness became a rocking chair. The giant bird triumphed to smiling air. And becoming a rocking chair, what does that make you think of? Up in the air, <laughs> turbulence. <laughs> Beds of pillars in every shape snuggled into a pathway was made for our escape. The voice announced, we'll soon be there. The beds of softness drifted without a care. So that was um, Mountains of Pillows. And this one, when I was growing up as a child, my pa parents, they said it was a garden, but I think it was a whole field acres of field that we had to get out and do um, chores. So I wrote this um, after I was married, the thought came to me, now why did we have to get up so early in the morning to go out in the field, to, uh, in the garden to work, hold um, the weeds and pull the weeds from the um, garden. So this, um, and my husband, he's going to get smart and plant a garden in the backyard. Well, he planted the garden, he harvested the garden. Well, I did put it up for him, but I wasn't going to get out there and help him <laughs> plant and, and tend to the garden. So garden chores. Child, get up out of that bed. The cabbage needs hoeing, and don't cut off a single head. Don't you hear me calling you? We've got to, we've got to get to the garden while there is morning dew. The wet and soggy dew put soles on my feet, and picking the cucumbers ain't no Sunday treat. Girl, don't let me have to come into that room, cause I'll talk to you with the old straw broom. Man, can I sleep a little late? The field's not going anywhere. Can't the hoeing wait? Child, what is that you grumbling about? What did you say you ain't going to do? Don't sass me, child. I saw the sun way before you. Child, get out of that bed. Go hold the field and plant the corn. I have to go and see if the pigs are born. Sowing seeds up and down the dusty rows. Just one more acre of weeds I've got to hoe. Child, do this. Child, do that. It's all you hear about doing chores. Mark my word, and that's a fact. When I grow up, I won't be hoeing or doing any of that. <laughs> and the um, insurance man, when I was young, the insurance man would come around and collect the dues from um, our parents. So this um, insurance man. He strolled into the stone hedge yard, carrying a box of whole life cards. He spied the children through the torn screen door. Tapping loudly, he yelled, are you there, Auntie Flo? I've come to collect for the premiums you owe. Can't you spare just a dime or more? Mama not having any money to spare sent us to stare the stranger's face stare. Mama said she's not here right now. The stranger turned and left with a frown. Why did you say you weren't here? Her face showered the strain she could not bear. 
I don't have that insurance man to think about when the food in my cupboard is nearly out. I know that, it's, I know that man is doing his job, but should my babies be, food, be robbed of food instead? I've subjected you to an untruthful way, and mama fell to her knees to pray. Lord, I needed that money I've stashed away to buy food for my babies to slay hunger today. And, and from this book, I do have one for dad. <laughs> so this poem is dad. We are so blessed to have a dad like you. You are there to support us in all that we do. Dad, you are one of a kind, God's special gem that's hard to find. There were no classes to be a dad. Following God's manual was all you had. You anchored yourself in this wisdom from above and led us gently with knowledge of love. Your guidance and directions are always wise. You are the one we trust to truly advise. We can depend on you for all our needs. God has made you a special dad indeed. And that's um, all I have prepared for you today. Are there any questions? Yes. I don't know how to explain the reaction to when you see somebody or something that you want to write about. And I was wondering if you could share a little bit with us about how you find these things that you want to write about and maybe comment if you keep a journal. Yeah, well, well, actually, um, some, I do keep a journal because even by my bedside, um, I have a notebook and a um, pencil when thoughts come to mind, I just jot it down. But sometimes if I see something, and, um, and actually I get inspiration because when I do my daily devotion, something in my daily devotion would inspire um, me to write something about what I've read or what I've seen or heard. And a lot of times when I write, I get inspiration from um, other people, just like, um, I think it was last year at church when the pastor was preaching, and um, I went home with her title. I wrote the title down of her sermon, and I went home and I wrote a poem about the sermon that she wrote, just using um, ideas from the things that she said. So it's most time just things that I've seen or things that I've heard, and sometimes People have asked me to write personal poems about themselves. Now that's hard, because if I don't know you that well, it's hard for me to um, write a poem, but then I'll think of the things that you do or the ways that you do it, and then that gives me um, the inspiration to go ahead and write the poem. But if I start writing, like I said earlier, without praying about it, the words are just jumble up and um, doesn't make any sense to me or anybody else. But once I pray about it, then um, the, God gives me clarity of what I should be writing and what I should be saying. Well, I'm also impressed with, you've talked about meditation and prayer, and that's the way I feel about poetry. It connects somehow to what you believe and that's so clear in your poetry. And I also love your sense of humor. <laughs> you share with us some really funny things. Thank well, you for that. Well, thank you very much. <laughs> yes. Well, at, like uh, uh, most time, maybe a couple of days, I will write it, you know, the rough draft, and then I'll go back and kind of clean it up. But most time, if um, it's something I really believe and feel, it takes me maybe a day. So, and some of them, like I said, when um, someone, like 
I think it was in this poem, um, if I can find it. Um, this member asked me to say, can you write a poem about me? I said, oh. <laughs> write a poem about you. But then I th uh, thought of the things that she did uh, in the community and things that she did at church. And um, I sat down and wrote that poem. Let me see if I can find it. But um, really, it doesn't take me that long to do a poem if, um, if I'm inspired. But like I said, sometime it'll take me days because, and then I'll get this voice. You're going ahead of me. You didn't, get, you didn't talk to me or anything like that. So, um, so this is the poem that this lady um, asked me to write um, about her. So I wrote this poem, and she said, and I'm going to take it to my grave. So I don't know if she did or not. <laughs> um, Simply Mrs. C is the title of it. Mrs. C is kind and sweet. Giving of herself is oh so neat. I met her many years ago. Her godly manner is all I know. She greets you with a kiss of love that brings a sense of calm like a peaceful dove. If you're feeling down and low, count on her for a cheery hello. She brings a smile to weary faces that says an angel from heaven dwells in this place. Serving others is her life, you see. Her dedication and perseverance is a model for me. Practicing the golden rule, she's, she thanks not robbery, but an everyday tool. Feeding the hungry or nursing the sick, Mrs. C is the one that we will pick. Cooking for the youth on a Saturday morn, never complaining when up before the crack of dawn. When you thank heaven on earth, thank Mrs. C and her priceless worth. Thank you for having a compassionate heart, stepping daily to the mound to do your part. You never grow weary and work that's good a trait you have acquired throughout adulthood. And that was the uh, first poem I wrote for a personal person and stuff like that. And I, and I was able to write that because I've been around her and I was able to observe her and um, I was able to compose it. Now this one took me a long time to do because uh, like I said, it was something personal that I was writing about. Um, yes, ma'am. Um, good morning. Um, your words are very inspirational and, and inspirational and visual. You know, we really see what you're reading about. Have you ever thought about doing um, reading cards, writing your, your own line of reading cards? Um, I did at one point before I started, um, and actually how I put it into a book, because people would ask me to write a poem. Uh, and I would just give them the poem. And uh, especially at church, I would, special occasions, I would write a, uh, poems. And uh, one of the members told me, I, I'm keeping all of the poems that you've ever written. And so that gave me an idea. So my son is the one who told me to, mom, stop giving your poems away and, <laughs> and put it in a book and sell it. So, but at first I thought about doing personal cards, but then um, I never did. <laughs> I, I will. <laughs> Someone else, yes, ma'am, my friend. I like your poetry. Are you, when can we expect the miracle? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I don't know. Uh, well, I do have some that I've um, some new pieces, maybe five or six, but um, I don't have enough to put in a book yet. So. <laughs> And maybe I'll put those in a, in a card form, like you said. <laughs> Anyone else? When did you get started in poetry, and how? Actually, I, really, when I retired in 1998 is when I, well, you know, I would do the, uh, lessons for the children at school, but um, start writing poetry for myself is after I retired. And, and I just started started writing poetry, and, um, and it start bloomed from there. <laughs> so. 
So, oh, one more question over here. Well, actually, it's not a question, but a comment. I'd just like to commend you on how you take everyday simple events and pull the beauty out of it. And you, you share enough of the story so that you can prop the hero. But yet you leave room for me to paint my story into your story. So I thank you for that. Thank you, my pastor. <laughs> And actually, and that's another thing, when I started, you know, in school, we had all these poems, it was so hard to dissect and understand. I said, I wanted to write simple poems that people can read it the first time and understand what the poem is talking about. They didn't have to think deep about that. What is she trying to say? So, but thank you for having me. <laughs> What a wonderful, wonderful program. What a blessing and uh, how special that is. So you, thank you for sharing with us today. Really enjoyed that very, very much. And uh, excited also just to be able to be here in the Wignall Auditorium. I always, as we've had our programs from this past September through now, expressed appreciation to the Wignall Auditorium and Dedrick Bonds, uh, who is the director here, to be able to use this facility um, we were homeless as we came into this season of our lectures through this year. And uh, the Winnie Auditorium very graciously has allowed us to be able to use this facility at this time, which has really been great. And we appreciate Dedrick, appreciate the Winnie Auditorium to be able to have it here. Um, it comes back to the library. We are homeless for another couple of months. Uh, the situation is such that <clears throat> It looks at this point that the new library will probably have a, what they call a soft opening where people will be able to come in and use the facilities probably in early May. Um, we were hoping for a little bit earlier than that, but some of the construction project has taken a little bit longer. And so they're hoping as we talk to Dwight McInvale, the librarian, head librarian, that we'll be able to be in there in early May. So looking forward to that very much. But also, as I say, the library has been able to uh, have um, uh, its homelessness resolved by many within a community. We've appreciated the opportunity to have the facility, temporary facility at the Howard Center. And I've talked to some of you about that, but that's really been wonderful. And it's allowed particularly the children's program there to reach out to another part of the community and to include them within the activities that have been occurring. The Friends of the Library dedicated ourselves when we first began this project and working with the library staff to help in any and every way we possibly can. And one of the things that happened, you may have noted the new auditorium that's there on Church Street that we'll be able to move into and we'll be starting our September programs, our lectures there at that time. That's when we're hoping to get back. Um, but also in addition to that, uh, we recently were involved in a landscaping project Although uh, funds originally had been budgeted for that purpose, I'm gonna get out of the sun. Uh, <laughs> uh, funds had been originally uh, dedicated for that purpose to do um, the um, landscaping at the library, but unfortunately it had to be used for some other things. And Dwight came to the friends and said, would we be willing uh, to pick up the costs uh, for being able to do landscaping around the library? So if you go and look at it today, uh, there's all beautiful landscaping all around, which, was done by a professional landscaper, but the labor, the backs, uh, were friends of the library who came and volunteered and did a lot of hard work. And it was a really wonderful experience to be able to do that. In addition to that, uh, the children's section is our particular interest. We're very much dedicated to making the children's section of the new library a very special place. Uh, there's a project actually that's gonna be beginning in a couple of weeks, and that is they're gonna be putting some murals on the walls and the friends at the library are going to be involved, excuse me, are going to be involved in uh, co the cost for those murals to go there specifically for children. But our major project is this project right here, Whispers of My Ancestor. And I want just to, if, if you've not heard about it, just if you allow me a moment or two to talk about this, you may recall last fall, Wesley Wofford, uh, there was a statue here, a memorial, a monument in town here uh, for Harriet Tubman, beautiful and a wonderful statue celebrating her life and her incredible work uh, that was here for a couple of three months, in fact. And um, while that was going on, we were in conversation with Wesley about the possibility of having something that he would create specifically for Georgetown uh, that would bring together what is Harriet Tubman's work with what was the connection, as you can see, 
uh, on here as well, a whole description of Harriet Tubman and uh, the work with, um, and I just lost it, um, our own, uh, yes, James Bowley. I just lost that in my head. Uh, old age, I need a poem, and that would help me remember. <laughs> with James Bowley and, and the wonderful connection between Harriet and her grand nephew, uh, James Bowley. And uh, as we have this opportunity for a statue, a model of which you see here, and actually about the size that it will be, will be at the entrance of the children's section in the library. And so we're working toward that. The cost, which will include all the, uh, the environment in which the statue will be placed, as well as the statue, is about $40,000 already, already. Many individuals have contributed toward this. $28,000 has already come in toward the $40,000, which we are really appreciative. This is the sort of thing I do in my head. That's about 69%, which means there's still a 31% uh, to go. And if you're interested in contributing toward that by having your name on the uh, part of the celebration there, we'd be very appreciative of your donations toward that statue that will be installed there probably sometime in 2025 as Wesley continues his work toward that and be able to put it there as a part of the children's. We think that's really special to see Harriet Tubman in terms of her significant contribution to the entire nation, but in a very special way, James Bowley and what was his participation here in Georgetown. Um, so if you're interested in doing that online, there's some information there about that. Our next, uh, our next talk uh, in this series is uh, Jason Flynn from Brook Green Gardens is going to be coming and speaking next month, which is going to be on April 16th. And uh, this is a little bit of a surprise. When you think of Brook Green, you think of statues and flowers. Uh, Jason is a, a geologist. Believe it or not, I mean, there's rocks way down there somewhere uh, <laughs> around here. But Jason's going to be coming and speaking on the topic of horticulture, or sorry, geology, ecology, and the environment and uh, from Brook Green Gardens. And it's going to be a very, very wonderful presentation, I'm sure, to join us here at this, uh, at this time, 10 o'clock in the morning on the third, third Tuesday in uh, April. Um, I think I've covered everything. Anybody have any questions about the library that I might be able to answer for you? Eunice, I thank you. What a wonderful morning this has been. Oh, the books are available. You were asking about the third book. Let's talk about the first and second book. <laughs> and if you're interested in purchasing this, uh, these, this is $10, this is $12. And there are copies of the book back there that you can pick up and purchase at this time. My wife is back there and she'll be very glad to sell them for, uh, for uh, Eunice in, uh, and, and to be able to sell those for her. Thank you all for being here today. And God bless you all. Thank you.